live from JBS Studios in the heart of Times Square in New York City, JBS presents in partnership with AZM, the American Zionist Movement, the first ever World Zionist Congress Election Forum. Welcome to the first ever World Zionist Congress Election Forum. We're coming to you live at 7 p.m. Eastern Time from our JBS studios in the heart of New York City's Times Square. And we're in partnership with AZM, the American Zionist Movement, which is administering the WZC's online election. I'm Mark Golub. And tonight we'll have the honor of presenting to you representatives of five of the slates hoping to win your vote to become formal delegates to the 38th World Zionist Congress that will take place this coming October in Jerusalem and help decide how to allocate $1 billion a year for Jewish causes. Who are these various slates? What Zionist philosophies do they represent? And what are their perspectives on some of the most sensitive issues challenging the state of Israel and the Jewish people today. Between now and March 11th, when online voting ends, every one of you who is a self-identified Jew is an American citizen who will not be voting in Israeli elections, is above the age of 18, and who registered to vote at ZionistElection.org, and who agrees to the platform of the World Zionist Organization, you have the right and opportunity to vote for the slate of your choice. And for your vote to be meaningful and intelligent, you need to know what each slate stands for, what their Zionist philosophy is, which is why we're holding these three nights of election forums. And to join me in the questioning of tonight's distinguished panel of Zionist representatives, I'm so pleased to be joined by two of my colleagues. Shachar Azani is Senior Vice President of JBS. If you're not yet familiar with Shachar's impressive history of service to the Jewish people, he's a Sabra, a native-born Israeli. He spent many years as a diplomat in Israel's foreign ministry, serving in Nairobi and Great Britain, L.A., and then in New York City, where he was media counsel for the Israeli consulate. Shachar then worked with Stand With Us, developing the campus activist organization's Northeast region. And it's a pleasure to be sitting with you, Shachar. Amen. And I am also joined by another wonderful colleague here at JBS, who many of you know very well. You see her every night. Our JBS senior news producer and anchor, Tisha Bader. What you may not know about Tisha is that she lived in Israel for 10 years. She has dual Israeli citizenship. Her parents and siblings live in Israel, and that's also where Tisha's two children were born. And all three of us will be directing questions to our five panelists in this World Zionist Congress Election Forum. And let me say, while JBS is partnering with American Zionist Movement, AZM. No one at AZM has interfered with JBS's editorial decisions in any way. To the contrary, AZM President, uh, Executive Director Herb Block, as well as Jeff Becker and Alicia Post, have only been as helpful and cooperative as possible in helping us arrange for our three nights of election forums with 14 of the 15 slates in this year's World Zionist Congress elections. And call it a vote. Many thanks to Herb and the entire AZM staff. Now, before we begin, let me show you the names of the five slates in tonight's forum and how they fared in last World Zionist elections in 2015. As you can see, the vote reform arts a slate easily won the most delegates of any party in 2015, winning a total of 56 seats of the 145 American seats up for grabs. Hatikva, the progressive slate, won only eight seats. And the right-leaning ZOA coalition won only seven seats. O of Zion, the Sephardic slate, 
won just four seats, and Chirut, the Jabotinsky slate, won only one slate, one seat. Then I want to explain to you how this JBS forum will work tonight. First, we're asking everyone to be succinct and to the point. We want everyone to have a chance to present their thinking to you. So we ask our participants to keep their answers to roughly 60 seconds. Second, we will give representatives the chance to dialogue with each other. However, in the spirit of JBS, no disagreement may be ad hominem or accusatory of another individual. No name calling. I have every hope that our panelists will each be passionate in their presentations of their own ideas and philosophy and positions, but that passion will be expressed in civil tones. And finally, we invite you, the JBS viewing community, to weigh in as well online with your questions, which we hope to address to our participants if we have time. So as you watch the discussion unfold tonight, if you have a question you'd like us to address to our panelists, you can post your questions on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash jbstvorg org, or you can tweet us at jbstvorg, jbstvorg. Now, each slate representative will have 90 seconds with which to make an opening statement that I hope will describe for you the distinctive philosophy or platform of each individual, each individual slate, and that will begin to give you a sense of whether a slate is one you would like to support with your online vote. And at the end of the program, each representative will have an opportunity to make a closing statement as well. And with that, I'd like to bring in JBS News senior producer and anchor, Tisha Bader. Thank you, Mark. And let's meet our five panelists for tonight's election forum. And as Mark said, we invite them to each take 90 seconds to introduce themselves and their slate. So let us begin with the representative of the Vote Reform, Arsa Slate, which is the Zionist arm of the reform movement and which is joined in coalition with the Reconstructionist movement. President of Arsa, Rabbi Josh Weinberg. Shalom, Erev Tov, and uh, a happy Chodesh Adar to everyone as we're entering just soon. It's really an honor to be with here and my esteemed colleagues here on the panel. Thank you to Mark and Tisha and Shachar. And let me begin by saying that we have an incredible opportunity before us, this once every five years opportunity to really have our voices as a diaspora community heard in Israel. And I'm encouraging our movement and everyone in the United States to vote for the Reform and Reconstructionist Movement slate for three main reasons. First, it's our position that we want to enliven and we want to apply the aspirational document of the State of Israel, none other than the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, Megillat Ha'atzma'ut. We want to say that Israel should be a Jewish and democratic country where we champion the values of freedom, justice, and peace as outlined in that document, where we want to talk about freedom of religion and freedom from religion, irrespective of race, sex, or anything else. That's number one. That is incredibly important to us. We also want to make sure that the state of Israel, as it is, that the Jewish people in its philanthropic efforts don't fund certain areas that we think are yet to come under consensus. Okay? We think that we, uh, we should have a say as to where the Jewish people's money goes. And we want to make sure that those areas that have yet to fall under consensus by an international recognized group or order uh, don't necessarily get the money of the Jewish people just yet. That's incredibly important. But really at our core, what we're all about and what our movement, our growing and expanding movement in Israel, is about changing what it means to be Jewish in the Jewish state. I think that Israelis are waking up to the reality that having a Jewish state doesn't necessarily mean having a Jewish community. And that this polarizing dichotomy between orthodox and secular no longer answers the needs of the mainstream. And that's why thousands and thousands of Israelis are flocking to our movement and are looking for deeper meaning in what it means to be Jewish. We have the opportunity to grow that. And the last thing that I would say is that this is an opportunity to really strengthen the ties between Israel and the diaspora community. 
It is time now to evolve that relationship. Of course, we in the diaspora see it as our role to support the growing state of Israel and everything that it does. And that is at the core and the fiber of our, of, of our being. However, today in this World Zionist Congress, I want to ask the question of what we have to learn from each community. We have an opportunity to ask what we in the diaspora Jews have to learn from Israel. And what does Israel have to learn for our, from our experience of creating vibrant community here in uh, the United States under a privatized economy where the government doesn't support religion? So that's what we're looking to do. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. I hope that everyone votes for us. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> here to represent the Hatikva slate, the progressive Zionist slate, that is a coalition of a cadre of progressive organizations, including Amenu, Americans for Peace Now, J Street, the New Israel Fund, the National Council of Jewish Women, and Truah is the chair of the executive board and vice president of Amenu Nomi Colton Max. Thank you very much, Tisha Erev Tov, Chodesh Tov. I'm so proud to be here this evening as a delegate and a representative of the Hatikva slate. Hatikva means hope. It's the name of the anthem that we heard as we started our broadcast tonight. This theme of hope and belief in Israel becoming the best country that we can be is also, as Josh said too, we too are inspired by Israel's Declaration of Independence. A state that will be based on the precepts of liberty, justice, and peace as taught by the prophets and will uphold the full social and political equality of all its citizens. And we are committed to continuing the work of progressive Zionists to achieve a just and thriving democratic state. Hatikva, as you said, is supported by 11 groups, and I do want to say them again. We're so proud of Aleph, Amenu, Americans for Peace Now, Habonim Dror, Hashomer Atzeir, J Street, Jewish Labor Committee, National Council of Jewish Women, New Israel Fund, Partners for Progressive Israel, and Trua. We are rabbis, we're veteran Jewish community professionals, we're youth movement leaders, we're labor union presidents, we're academics, we're artists and activists from across the nation. We were the first slate to, to declare a commitment to 50% women, to Jews of color and support the LGBTQ plus community. We have over 20 Israelis on our slate who have served in the army. We speak Hebrew, we celebrate culture, and we are running on ideas old as Zionism and the World Zionist Congress itself, progressive Zionists. Progressive Zionism, built on the tradition of the labor and socialist traditions that built the Strait of Israel. <laughs> We're striving to improve on fairness and dignity, for peace, pushing for acceptance of religious and cultural pluralism, and of course, we oppose uh, occupation and annexation. So over the next few hours, I look forward to telling you more about the Hatikva slate and why you should vote for Hatikva with us for hope and belief in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nomi. Now representing the ZOA coalition headed by the Zionist Organization of America and a coalition of 27 Zionist organizations, including Esh HaTorah, AFSI, Americans for a Safe Israel, the Lawfare Project, NORPAC, and World Likud is ZOA's Director of Special Projects, Liz Burney. Thank you, Erev Tov. ZOA was at the very first World Zionist Congress in 1897, helping lay the foundation to revive the Jewish state, our people's 2,000-year-old dream. At the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, ZOA and the World Zionist Organization presented the proposals that led to the binding international agreements legally guaranteeing the Jewish people's rights to closely settle and reconstitute our whole homeland, Israel. In today's World Zionist Congress, the ZOA coalition of 27 of the strongest pro-Israel organizations is leading the battle to defend Israel, sovereignty, and the Jewish people. At the most recent World Zionist Congress, every single pro-Israel and pro-Jewish resolution was initiated by the ZOA coalition. The ZOA coalition led the successful two-year battle to pass a resolution to combat boycotts against all Jews, including Jews living in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria. We initiated and passed uh, and attain passage of the resolution giving highest funding priority to rescuing and bringing to Israel Jews who are endangered by global anti-Semitism and much, much more. We prioritize the safety of every Jew and promote positive Jewish and Zionist education, the Jewish people's historic religious and legal rights to live in our homeland, including Judea and Samaria, United Jerusalem, Israel's vital security measures, and love and respect for Torah tradition and every Jew. Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, Israel's major ministers, Knesset member Yuli Edelstein, the regional council heads and mayors have all called on every American Jew to vote for the ZOA coalition, slate number 11. I hope that you all will do so. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. 
And here representing the Ohavet Sion slate, which is the slate of the world Sephardic Zionist Jews in America, is the chairman of the Ohavet Sion slate, Rabbi Eli Abadi, MD. Good evening, uh, and I echo the greeting of my uh, panelists here, Chodesh Tov, Erev Tov, Tisha, Mark, and Shahar. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, I founded Ohavet Sion in the previous 37th uh, uh, Zionist Congress because uh, myself and a group of friends of mine from the Sephardic community realized that it was about time that the Sephardic community participate in the formal political Zionist movement. There may have been some Zion uh, Sephardic presence in previous Congresses, but it was never a real presence and it was never represented by, by the Sephardic community throughout the world. Sephardim have been Zionists for not just a century since 1897, Theodor Herzl uh, Zionist Congress, but Sephardim have been Zionists for over a thousand years and more. The Zionism of Sephardim is a Zionism of tradition, is a Zionism of the Bible, is a Zionism of our, of our values, and that's how we taught all our children. For many sages from the Rishonim, Harambam who made Aliyah, Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi who also made Aliyah, Rab, uh, the Ramban, Rabbi Nachman also made, an, made Aliyah, the, all the, uh, the 15th century uh, uh, Kabbalists, Rabbi Yosef Kaur, Rabbi Yaakov de Merav, all of them made Aliyah. And certainly, if we want to speak about political Zionism, really started before Theodor Herzl, but Rabbi Yehuda Al-Kalai from Sarajevo, and by Rabbi Yehuda de Vivas. Uh, and both of them, 50 years before Theodor Herzl is even born or thought about any of those uh, issues, they went around European countries and Middle Eastern countries speaking with the Jewish community to establish a Zionist movement to return to the land of Israel, to establish uh, sovereignty there and Jewish uh, communal life. And so, in fact, it is uh, believed that the grandfather uh, of uh, Theodor Herzl, who was one of the congregant of Rabbi Huda Al-Kalai, uh, and as Rabbi Huda Al-Kalai explained to, to uh, Mr. Herb Loeb, who was the grandfather, and possible that Theodor Herzl learned that from his grandfather, in a sense. So what I'm trying to say is we established Ohav Sion because we wanted Ohav Sion to represent the Sephardic community. And, of course, we have... Uh, uh, a, a reason for that because we are part of the Jewish people and we have a lot to say about Zionism and the direction of the Jewish people and the Jewish education. Uh, we believe that as, uh, as uh, Sephardim, we want to have a voice and influence in the direction of Jewish education within our communities and throughout the world. This will enable us to provide funding for programs in support of Jewish education, identity, Zionism, and the support of the State of Israel as a Jewish homeland. We as Sephardim must chart our future within the Jewish people with tradition, values, and inclusiveness. For too long we have been silent. This time, the time has come to take responsibility, to share the beauty of our Sephardic heritage with our Jewish brethren, and to allow our voice to be heard. Uh, Ohavet Sion is comprised of a list of delegates from all segments of the Jewish people representing our various and unique communities. And what we really want to is to ensure the future of Jewish people by furthering Jewish and Zionist education. We want to foster the centrality of, Jew, of Israel as the home of the Jewish people. We want to partake in the dissemination of substantial funds. We want to instill the love of Torah values and the appreciation of Mizvot. We want to pursue Jewish unity and respect for each other. And we want to defend the rights of Jews anywhere in the world against anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Thank you, Eli. And finally, here representing the Herut Slate, which is committed to the vision of the early 20th century revisionist Zionist leader, Zev Jabotinsky, is a member of the Herut Slate, Yonatan Herzfeld. Hi, so I'm Yonatan Herzfeld, and I'm a Jewish college student. And I joined the Herut movement because they represent me. Herut is an international grassroots movement of unapologetic Zionists. We're nonpartisan, and we're truly pluralistic. We're proactive, not reactive, so we're actively training the next generation of Zionist leaders in the United States. While other organizations tell their activists what to do, we let our activists take an active role in determining the path of our movement. The executive director of Khairut doesn't take one penny, not one cent. We put all of our money into Zionist education around America. Not only that, but we stand for human rights. We stand for an undivided capital of Jerusalem. And we have the crazy notion that Israel 
is the homeland of the Jews, and it's not illegal for Jews to live in our ancestral homeland of Israel, especially Judea and Samaria. We believe that Jews living in our ancestral homeland is not what's preventing peace in the Middle East. The problem is we don't have a real peace partner. But Chirut doesn't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. We recently put out a security handbook to help empower Jewish communities around the world for how to protect themselves. And this security handbook had input from NYPD officers and IDF soldiers. And within just a few weeks, we had over 1,000 requests for the handbook. In addition, for this resolution, we, for this World Zionist Congress, we already have a proposed resolution to designate funding to help protect Jewish communities around the world. We stand for Jewish unity. We stand with the people of Israel. And we stand for unapologetic Zionism. So please join me and support Khairut. Thank you, Yonatan. And thank you to all of the panelists joining us tonight for JBS's World Zionist Congress election forum number one. OK. So now that you've met the five slates, to ask the first question of the forum, here is JBS Senior Vice President Shahar Azani. Thank you very much for joining us. <clears throat> and it's a pleasure having you all. And now it's time to get down to business. I would like to uh, address the first question, which all of you will have a chance to answer, to Liz Burney, ZOA. You mentioned in your introductory remarks a term that has become prevalent in the Jewish community and beyond. You said pro-Israel. And I would like to ask you, what does it mean to you? How do you define anti-Israel, pro-Israel? Can you elaborate on that? Um, I define pro-Israel as somebody who supports the rights of the Jewish people to live in the entire Jewish homeland, who believes that Jews have the right to live in Judea and Samaria, and the, you know, understands that this is actually fact, this is actually international law. As I mentioned in my introduction, Z08 was involved in uh, obtaining the international legal framework that, that guarantees these rights. Uh, we, when uh, Pompeo made this wonderful statement, uh, a couple of weeks ago, recognizing that uh, uh, communities in Judea and Samaria are illegal, uh, and that and this, this policy of the United States, uh, we applauded that. We believe that that is part of being pro-Israel. We were very disappointed that some of the people on this, uh, some of the organizations, uh, in some of the of some of the people in this panel, actually criticized that statement. At least they should acknowledge that the Jews have the right to Judea and Samaria and all of Jerusalem. Uh, this is, you know, people who I want pe people to understand that the mandate guaranteed this to, to us, the San Remo did, this was never changed. The UN, uh, the first UN resolution, uh, the UN Charter also guaranteed those rights. Those rights have never been abrogated. Um, Anti-Israel, anti, an anti-Israel, I would say, are things like going to the UN, as J Street did, which is one of the, uh, the groups on the Hatifa slate, went to the UN and asked the UN to pass Resolution 2334, which is a resolution that says that this is not our land, that nothing over the green line is Israeli, is, is, is Israeli land, that this is all, quote, occupied Palestinian territory. Going to the UN to act against the act against Israel to me in my book would be anti-Israel. What about um, um, American Jewish leadership meeting with the Palestinian uh, leadership? Is that anti-Israel in your opinion? Me meeting, I don't have a specific problem with. It depends on what the meeting is about. If the meeting is about, you know, demand making demands on the Palestinian leadership to stop, uh, you know, for instance, paying terrorists. $350 million a year to, to, re, to reward them for murdering Jews and Americans, I'm all in favor of meeting and making those demands on them. Um, if meeting is, for instance, what J, J, you know, what J Street's uh, leader, you know, part of the Hatikva slate, did last week and went to the UN and started kissing uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the dictator who is responsible for the Munich, for financing the Munich Olympics where Israel's uh, athletes were slaughtered and tortured and castrated, I don't think that they, they should be, they should be, uh, that uh, Jewish leaders should go and kiss so somebody with opinion, blood, blood on his hands. With somebody, yes, yeah, somebody who kisses somebody with that much Jewish blood on, on his hands, I, I would turn, I guess I would turn that anti And let me just ask you one more thing. Do you think that it's okay for, or what do you think about an American Jew who decides not to purchase products manufactured in the settlements in Judea and Samaria? 
I, I think that, that that's a form of boycott. And in fact, one of the, you know, as I mentioned in my introduction, one of the things that we, we did, it took us two years to get it through, was to pass a resolution uh, requiring that all that the, the groups in the World Zionist Congress will combat that, will combat so if people just, boycotting just beyond other being Jews. negative, that is anti-Israel. I'm sorry? Beyond just being negative, this is anti-Israel, in your opinion? You define this as anti-Israel? I'm just trying to understand. You know, I've never thought of the definition, but this, this is boycotting fellow Jews, which I think is a, it really is a, grave, is a grave sin. I mean, under the, the Torah, you're interfering with Jews' livelihoods. There's 750,000 Jews living in these areas over the Green Line. This, this is extremely wrong. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know I, it's like a term in anti-Israel. But this is really anti-Jewish. It's, it's, it's discrimin, discriminating against fellow Jews. It's, uh, you know, it's wrong under, you know, every bit of Jewish law. If, the, if this was done in the United States, it would be illegal discrimination. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, the, my two colleagues over here are talking about cutting off any investment going over the green line. And so just, just to end this point, <coughs> any American Jew who chooses to do so is anti-Israel. I think they're doing the, they're doing the wrong thing. It, and it's, it's, you know, certainly just, just it, it, they're, do, they're the doing the wrong, they're definitely doing the wrong thing. It's anti you know, if I, I could turn it anti-Israel. I could. I, I could you. turn it anti-Israel. Thank anti you, Liz I, I Bernie. I, uh, well. All of you will get a chance to respond, <clears throat> but I wish to go now to Nomi Hatikva. You heard the question and the surrounding. Can't I, wait I to hear it. I heard the question, like. and um, I, I want to be clear, first of all. I believe that anybody who is standing up here, anybody that gives their time and their attention and their commitment to the American Zionist movement, of which we uh, are all members of, to the World Zionist Congress, is doing this because they believe in Israel. They are Zionist. We are doing this for the better of the Jewish people. Nekuda. And to think that anybody who disagrees with what somebody else says about Zionism is therefore not a Zionist or is anti-Israel saddens me immensely. We're, we're Jews. Uh, uh, Elia Abadi mentioned earlier, he talked about some great Jewish intellectuals and Talmud scholars. Jews have not agreed since then. Um, and so why would we agree now? And since the beginning of the World Zionist Congress, when all of the different groups of Zionism came together, we did not always agree, but we need to work together and respect together. And I think it's important for us to remember that we all are pro-Israel. So let me ask you, is there anybody or anything in your opinion that you can refer to as anti-Israel? What would you call anti-Israel? So I, uh, I believe that everybody who is running on the World Zionist Congress has agreed to the Jerusalem program, which means that we support Zionists. <clears throat> And what we're talking about for Israel are people that believe in Israel as a Zionist democratic state. So what is anti-Israel? I'm pushing on that point because so I want to understand your opinion. So what is anti-Israel? Anti-Israel to me, I am not interested as we are none of up here, up here. I'm talking about a binational state. We are talking about a Zionist state as was in the Declaration of Independence that is in our platform for the World Zionist Congress. And Hatikva is made up, as we know, of 11 different groups that have come together for this very issue to work and make sure that it is clear that we all want a safe and democratic Israel. We're not the only ones that feel this way. There are, there are members of, 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 of the Israeli army and leaders who have come out and said that the best thing for Israel is to get out of the shtachim, at, out of the occupied territories. So, that is not coming from us here as Americans. That is coming from within Israel. So anti-Israel So to then, you so just to answer your question, yeah. does that mean that if a general says that in the army that they are anti-Israel? I don't think so. Right. So and the you, same way that they don't say that, I don't think so. So to you, anti-Israel is outside of the camp, but you feel that anybody who, for instance, meets with Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority, cannot be considered anti-Israel? So, so it depends on how you do. Look, let's be clear. Nobody loves their enemies. Right? It's not that we pick who we get to go to the table with and have a discussion. Whether that's having a little coffee on a sicha and a discussion on, uh, on an issue, or whether it's on something that's been uh, important to the people that lived, to these two peoples that have lived in this area, going back from as long as we can remember, from the creation of the state. So to say that we can decide who the person is that we're going to sit down at the table is, is not our position. And if somebody has been elected there to do that, then we have to meet with them. 
we all do not agree on everything and that's part of the game and that's part of the negotiations and there are public negotiations and there are private negotiations. And anyone who has ever been involved in international affairs and diplomatic affairs knows that. What Sometimes what you say publicly and what you say privately are two different things. And at the moment, Mahmoud Abbas is who is there for us to meet with and that's what we need to do. And at the same time, we, who as delegates from Hatikva at the World Zionist Congress, uh, we hope next year, we also want to be pushing that there are people that are living with, you know, within the area, other people on the ground that have been working and are committed to this two-state solution, and we need to work with them. We work with leaders. We are, as I said, we are a bunch of activists. We are all coming from these groups together to work together, and that means that we work with leadership. We work with people who are who are right down, you know, in different organizations. We're working together because we are all pro Israel. Including and I, I just want to say, am just as unapologetically a Zionist and a pro-Israeli person as anyone else here on this stage today or in this room. So let me ask you this, and thank you so much. Is BDS anti-Israel? Is the BDS movement anti-Israel? So anti -Israel? again, to be, to be a delegate in the World Zionist Congress and to sign on to the Jerusalem program, we have to say that we are against BDS. And I do not support BDS. And the, and the slate does not support BDS. Including boycotts of goods and services produced by Jewish communities we in We do Judea not support that. That is not what we're working on here for this. We are talking about this election and we are all agreeing that we are not, <coughs> uh, we are not part of the BDS movement. The BDS movement is, is, a, is a whole other category, which I'm sure we're going to discuss, so I don't want to get into that exactly now. But Thank the BDS you. movement involves much more than just talking about the goods and services that are in the occupied territories. The BDS so. movement involves sanctions, involves trying to, many trying to get thank to the end you. of Israel. I thank you very much. The purpose of this is really to understand what pro-Israel and anti-Israel means as a framework of this discussion and so important to our viewers and anybody who casts a vote in these elections. Eli, I'd love to hear you uh, on this issue. Yeah, I will try to be succinct. But the way I see things is anybody who is pro-Israel <clears throat> is any individual group or organization who support the building up of Israel, the inhabiting of Israel, the fulfillment of the Zionist dream. And that Zionist dream, as seen by Theodore Herzl, did not exclude Judea and Samaria. That Zionist dream that the Bible speaks about did not ex exclude Judea and Samaria either. And so therefore, anybody who builds up Israel, who wants to see Israel succeed, wants to see Israel uh, go ahead, inhabit the land and fulfill the dream, that's a pro-Israel person, individual, or group. And if you do not? If you do not, what's an anti-Israel individual uh, group or organization? Is that individual group or organization that they want to destroy part of Israel? Doesn't have to, doesn't have to be the entire state of Israel. It could be a region, it could be a community, it could be a neighborhood. Destroying it or boycotting their product, and doesn't matter if it's Judea, Samaria, and Israel proper, as they call it. What if it's not and, supporting, rather than destroying, so, not so, supporting? So, I love every member here that is, and we are really very close to each other. Every single individual Jew that is standing here, I love them as a fellow Jew, and I love all the members of their slate and all the organizations of their slate. But of course, we agree to disagree on certain points. The difference is we could agree and disagree, and we could, in a sense, work to change the law or work to convince others. But once an organization or a fund does act to undermine the legitimacy of the state of Israel or the legitimacy of the, of the Israeli defense forces or the legitimacy of the sovereignty of, of the state of Israel in certain neighborhoods, that is no longer an opinion. That's an action. And that action is anti-Israel. So do you we see can, yourself meeting Mahmoud Abbas in the corridors of the UN? I could meet him to instruct him what he needs to do. I could meet him to yell at him and tell him you are missing a great opportunity. I will not meet him to be in cahoots with him to undermine Israel as a former prime minister did, just did. So there's a difference between opining, there's a difference between disagreeing, there's a difference between sitting and trying to convince each other of what's our, our, what, what we believe in. That's fine, and I agree with that, and that's what democracy is all about. But the moment you take actions to undermine the Israeli sovereignty in areas, to undermine the Israeli Clear. soldiers, to undermine, to delegitimize or demonize the state of Israel, and some of those groups are in certain slates that are represented here tonight. Thank and so you. therefore, to me, those are not just anti-Zionism, those are anti-Israel. Thank you, Eli. Jonathan, the voice of the younger generation, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, what is your take on what's anti-Israel and pro-Israel? Yes, so on my college campus, I very often experience um, 
anti-Israel activity, and I know what it's like to face that. So us at the Chayrut movement, we believe that Zionism is the civil rights movement of the Jewish people. It's the belief that the Jewish people can settle and live in our ancestral homeland of Israel, including Judea and Samaria. And we need to be clear that being pro-Israel means you support the Jewish people's right to live there. And now I'd just like to address a question. There you mean? In Israel and Judea and Samaria, and the Judea Golan Heights. So anybody who does not Israel, believe in that right, I think there is flexibility in terms of if you don't support Jews living in Judea and Samaria, that doesn't necessarily mean you're an anti-Zionist, but... Anti-Israel. I want anti to understand anti-Israel. Anti-Israel in your opinion? Um, I would not necessarily say that word, but there is counteractivism. So tell me, what, what's, what is that word? What would you say is anti-Israel in your opinion? Anti-Israel is uh, the belief that Israel does not have a right to exist, the belief that Israel does not have a right to exist as a Jewish state, and I think demonizing Israel amongst the entire world, putting a double standard, boycotting the only Jewish state, I think that is a form of discrimination, and we all can agree up here that discrimination is wrong, and we need to be against discrimination, do especially you see yourself, against our people. Do you see yourself meeting with Mahmoud Abbas at the UN to counter the position of the uh, incumbent Israeli government? I would meet with him, but there has to be some conditions. First of all, I'm, I'm not going to kiss him. I'm not going to praise him. That, that's a way of praising. This is someone who, as, um, as she said, he has blood on his hands, Jewish blood on his hands. You mean Liz, right? but Liz, Liz mentioned. Yes. Yeah. He has a policy right now where he uses humanitarian aid that is given to the Palestinian Authority to fund and financially incentivize terrorists to murder Israeli Jews. He is targeting people based on their religion and their nationality. But meeting I, with him is not anti-Israel. Meeting with him, I would personally put it under the condition that he ends the pay-for-slay policy. I would condition meeting with him on that, because that is something that is a deal-breaker for me. If you have a policy to pay for people to murder Jews, I am not going to meet with you until you end that. What would you define as an anti-Israel activity on campus? Anti-Israel. Anti-Israel. Anti-Israel activity that you have seen witnessed on campus, on college campus. Um, holding a sign that says Zionism is terrorism. That's, that's pretty offensive, especially doing that in response to a Yom Hatzmut. A Yonatan, in, in holding a sign that says Benjamin Netanyahu is a racist. Is that anti-Israel? No. I think everyone can have their opinion on world leaders. People can think that he's a racist, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily hate Israel. Once they group the Jews together as a collective and blame all Jews collectively for the <clears throat> actions of some or for the policies of the government they disagree with, that's when you cross the line. An American Jew who says that uh, Israelis have no right to live in Judea and Samaria, is that anti-Israel? Yes, it is, because okay. as of now, Area C is under Israeli control. Jews have just as much right to live there. And um, as one of the other panelists up here said, there's no world consensus that Jews can live there. Well, the Trump administration just declared that it is not illegal for Jews to live there. So. And I think that you're referencing Josh Weinberg yes, about I the am. consensus. Yes, and I am. Josh, the ball is in your court. Anti-Israel, what is it? I, I still wanted to ask questions, so I'll ask after. Maybe him. after, okay. yeah, after. We I'm not actually sure why that's the question that we're opening with, because I want to make sure that we're sticking to the relevance of the World Zionist Congress specifically. But I'll take a stab right, I'll, at I'll answer that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because in the sense of what we're doing here, it reflects my philosophy. The reason why a question like that is asked, and is asked of all five of you, is that our viewers have a right simply to understand your mentality and your perspective. The World Zionist Congress in specific is a lot of weeds for most people. And by the way, it's weeds for people who have been there. And I could ask you questions. You, wouldn't, you've, you served in the World Zionist Congress. And there are things you don't understand about the world's sure. answer. So I'm not interested in doing that to our viewers. What I do want to do for our viewers is give them a chance to hear what five different parties, what right. their <clears throat> perspective is on the most critical issues confronting Jewish life today. One of them is, and it was referred to by at least one panelist, we hear all the time, Josh, pro-Israel and anti-Israel. And very yeah. often there were people who are critical of other Jews because they say they are anti-Israel. And what I wanted our audience to hear from all five of you is, as, and Shachar's done it beautifully, what do you guys mean if you ever say sure. somebody else <coughs> is anti-Israel? And all five of you had the right to say nothing. 
There's nothing somebody could do that would be anti-Israel. I don't know that you'd want to, but that's why that's the first question that I wanted asked of all five of you. Fair enough, and thank you for the explanation. Sure. I'll say very succinctly that I think having a relationship with Israel is a fundamental and core principle to being Jewish. And I think that's what we're all doing here. And that our tradition teaches us that we have three sacred relationships. In, in Aramaic, actually, we say Yisrael, or right to the Kudsha Brichu. God, Torah, and Israel are the fundamental cores. So let's focus on Israel, what it means. And I think that all of us as Jews have a, have a relationship with Israel, with the Jewish people, with Klal Yisrael. Um, and so I would say that anyone who's pro-Israel is someone who recognizes the right of Israel to exist as the Jewish state. And those who are anti-Israel don't. That's it. And when you're saying relationship with Klal Israel, we uh, let's talk about one part of Klal Israel, for instance, the Israeli government. Sure. Uh, would you meet with Mahmoud Abbas in case you know that the purpose of the meeting would be to criticize or uh, a position of the incumbent government? Is that Well, if that's legitimate? the purpose, I think my message to Mahmoud Abbas, if I were to meet him, would to encourage him to sit at the negotiation table. Okay, fair enough discussion. Right. Yeah, let's see. You had a question? No, I, I wanted to Liz? Comment. I wanted to comment on uh, what okay. I know we I'm going to I'm going to remind all of you, be as brief as you possibly can. Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, I would like to challenge the idea that um, the statement by Ms. Max, Ms. Colton Max, that, uh, that Hatikva does not engage in boycotts. First of all, one of the groups on their slate is Americans for Peace Now. I don't know if your camera can see this. No, we can't. Um, Keep going. Now. Okay, but it states that Americans for Peace Now advocates boycotting settlement products and recognizes legi legit legitimacy and potential value of other activism directly and narrowly targeting, targeted at settlements and the, the, what they call the occupation. Um, then okay. That's, that, you that, want that's to answer their, that? That's their no, point. One, no, one more. Stop. One more. One at a time. You, okay. What's your answer to that? So look, again, we've talked about this. We've talked about the fact that in order to sign the Jerusalem program and to run and to be part of the Hatikva slate, we have to be in, in, against BDS. That's what it talked well, about. What, what so we're going to talk about the settlement is, if we if we want to get into a discussion. Did, did Liz, and again, did Liz no, I'm going to answer incorrectly. Um, you know, at the moment, I am. I, I don't need it's to right, see right. right at the moment. At the end, too, I, I'm with Josh. I think that what we really need to be focusing on is how something like that and how she feels something like that or I feel that our progressive approach about being against creeping annexation, occupation, how the deals, how that impacts the, the World Zionist Congress okay. and it does impact in okay. how we talked about it. Okay. So if I you want to answer, so I, I, I will answer. Okay. We're talking about in those settlement products that was there, this has not been something that has been talked about in this election. The ZOA has tried to bring this up. We, we've talked about that it's not there, but there are some <clears throat> groups that have talked about just those settlement areas. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It's, there are people that can go on both ways. You'll all remember the SodaStream example, right? Uh, SodaStream was, was one of these examples that came up where people said um, uh, it exists and I'm not going to buy the SodaStream product because, because it was there. Some people felt that way. Others looked at that product and looked at who was working in that factory where there was coexistence, where there were projects going on in that factory, and said, maybe that is better off than when they then took the, the, the factory out of the Shtachim and they put it in Israel. So, so there are some people that have been talking about this, and this is a debate, and it's a very interesting debate. You talked about it in terms of the economics and how it impacts. It's not an easy call. There's a lot going on, but it is a very different play than to be a supporter of BDS. They are not the same thing. Okay, I just okay. want to understand. So, no, um, because the, the question was, the issue was raised, and you were very clear, I thought you were, you were very clear, that it is inappropriate to say that the Hatikva slate includes a BDS component. Correct. Okay. And then Liz says, well, wait a minute. It's a fair question, and there's that's why a, I was answering yeah, it. Yeah, there's a group inside your coalition that she says is, in fact, supportive of BDS, which would... They would say ways, that they, that which they would are not. Suggest, which suggest, you know, it's, you think what she's read is in, incorrect. Uh, I, I'm not going to look at where Liz and what the date is. I'm not. Right. It's last year. But, I, it's but I, think, I think it's important Okay, for let us. me ask it a different way. If she's right... So I think I answered that too. I'll I think, ask it again. Okay. If she's right, and that there's a group inside your coalition which in fact supports BDS, 
Does it make you change your, your answer at all to the question? So it doesn't because you just use the word BDS. And I would say that even what Liz talked about was not BDS, right? And that's what I'm trying to point out here. Liz said- A boycott is part of BDS. The a boycott is part of, that's, that's one of the, the essence of a, BDS. The, the, boy, boy, boycotting the BDS fellow movement. Yes. Well, like I want to have, I want you have a right. You have, every one of you has the right to your position. All we want to do is understand it. So what I hear you're saying to me now is, I may not be for, be, I may not be comfortable with anyone inside the Hatikva coalition that supports BDS. I don't believe boycotts alone is what BDS means. Correct. I okay. do not believe that a settlement, okay. but uh, a product do, boycott, which is what Shahar asked, but a product the boycott was. is something you are comfortable with. There are some people. There will be some people, and I'm sure that Liz is going to come back to me in a minute. Um, with who or why or how as to say what that is. What I'm I saying to you, what I, 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 mean, I want to answer that. your question. So what care. I'm saying to you is that that we, as, as people on the Hatikva slate, are Zionists and no. are doing, wait, listen, uh, and you talked about- You're all Zionists. Right, that's what I'm gonna say to you. Okay. And we talked about doing all of and this for the better and is, safer we Israel. Want right, the, so let me answer. Wait, it's hard Mark, for me to get this, uh, no. It's hard for me to get this through. What we want to understand from the five, you're all Zionists. You wouldn't be here otherwise. That's what I'm trying okay. to say to you. But you are Zionists with different philosophies. Correct. Okay. And, and Liz has her philosophy. Doesn't matter whether I, Shachar, or Tisha agree or not. It doesn't matter. It only matters that the audience understands. So Liz says the following. If you're thinking of voting Hatikva, understand there are people inside the Hatikva coalition which at least support boycotts of products on the West Bank. And it seems to me that you would say, yeah, that's right. And that's all, and that's the end of the discussion. So, yes, that's right. And there are some people who believe that there should be boycotts and that, that then they should vote Hatikva. Or there may be people who say, you know what? If Hatikva, if Hatikva even tolerates the notion of boycotts, I don't want to vote for that party slate. And that's all I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to give the viewers an opportunity to hear what is in the essence of each of your slates. What did you want to say? So wait, can I answer? You asked me, so I think I, d I need to answer it, or Josh, and that I'd like to really answer because... No, if, I, if, if you need to answer, go okay. ahead. So what I was trying to get at was that um, I, I, and I believe, and this is why this question is coming from Liz, that, that because we've obviously had this discussion before, that you cannot be someone that has talked about the benefits of uh, boycotting a settlement and be a strong Zionist or an unapologetic That's Zionist right. she's or already, believe in the state of Israel. She's already made that okay, point. So what I am trying to say is that I believe that there are lots of people yes. on our slate and that, and that when there are those that have talked about that in the past, that they have talked about it because they believe that that is the of way for course, them to be the strongest. That's what I, but that's and what all, you asked me to what we wanted yes, the, and the viewers the, to clear, and that's what I wanted to be clear to. The answer is of course. Okay. The that's people good. who are part of your slate of Hatikva believe that the best, what they're doing for Israel is best. All five of Correct. you think that. And what we're trying to do is identify, and it's very hard, by the way, to get Jews to identify. Even as I listen to the five opening comments, and by the way, if I were one of the five of you, I would be scared. I don't know that I could articulate in 90 seconds a platform, but, but I do say as somebody who's outside, I know what you are, and I could explain it in 30 seconds. I know the, what I want to do, what, what's the uniqueness of OABE Tzion? What makes you different? I know what makes you all the same. You're all Zionists. And I want to know, you know, what makes Nomi different? Uh, and, you know, and what makes Josh different? And what makes uh, Liz different? And what's makes Yonatan different? That's what I'm looking for. And nobody here, and I want to make this very clear to our audience, nobody here on this panel or here would say any of you are not passionate Zionists. But you're Zionists in different ways, with different emphases. And the best thing you can do today is be as honest as you can about, yeah, there are people on, my, on our slate who believe that you, you do boycott certain products on the West Bank. And that, that leads to a, a substantive debate and also gives the viewer 
which information, and in the world Jewish community, information is almost impossible to extract. So I want to make it clear. I am not criticizing I don't one think we're bit. Criticizing me. Okay, I'm not. I'm not criticizing any one of the five I of you. I don't care what your that. positions are. I care about only one thing. We are, JBS gets to what those are. Okay, what did you want to say? Yes, well, first of all, I thought, I think, and I <coughs> hope that in my 90 seconds, I was able to tell you the essence of what it's you, you. What you told me, what, what you told me was, is there are Sephardic Jews and the Sephardic community that hasn't been represented. Yes. That's not a philosophy. That, that means if I'm Sephardic, I guess I'll vote for no, you. No, but I, I think, you, wa I think you want more I do. than just Sephardic in no, your... Of course. Okay, of and course there's a do. reason. There's some uniqueness That's about right. your view right. of what Zionism right. is. And I'm, I want to hear well, that. And hear, I know you have it, no, by I, the way. I have it, but I did not have enough time. I had to bring some Yes, because you start in the wrong place. But I will place. do that maybe at the, at the closing remarks. Okay. Anyway. But I want to say something about, about uh, mention. Uh, uh, Nomi... I'm sorry to say, uh, but member, member organizations in your slate are hiding behind semantics. There's no such thing. If you are a BDS, so of course when they say we are not BDS because they're thinking about what they think pre-67 Israel, we don't boycott it, that, mean, that means we are not members of BDS. But if it's Judea and Samaria, we're not considered to be BDS. That's the hiding behind semantics. Organizations like J Street and the New Israel Fund they fund NGOs to undermine Israeli soldiers. They, they incite Arab population in Judea and Samaria to beat up soldiers. And they take uh, photographs and they take cameras. And so don't tell me that's not BDS. And don't tell me if you boycott products from Judea and Samaria is not BDS. It's semantics. It is BDS. If it's pre-67 line or, or after 67 line, it's BDS. And so therefore, some of those organizations, they have to come up lean. I agree with you, Mark. Let them say, yes, I am for BDS and I'm still a Zionist. I respect that. But don't tell me I'm not a BDS. I just boycott Judea and Samaria products. But I'm not a BDS. That, to me, is coward. Josh, so, your comment? Yeah, let me try and reframe a little bit. You asked about pro-Israel and anti-Israel. And I think you know, we in the reform movement, is, uh, we've been progressively, pun intended, uh, becoming more and more pro-Israel. We are the only religious organization that actually unanimously affirms the Jerusalem program as a board. And okay, I, 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 I want to reframe continue, the question here. It's so about, interesting, and, yeah. I, and this comes to what Shakhar was trying to get at. What makes, you, what makes the reform movement now expressed through Artsa, what makes you now right. more pro-Zionist than Reform Judaism used to be? Sure. Because it's in everything that we do right now. And I want to I want to say a as little bit about to what uh, as opposed to as what? opposed to what what was Reform Judaism? Oh, a hundred years ago, I don't think it will shock anyone that the Reform movement oh, was is that what we're talking we're overwhelmingly. About 10 years? And in fact, actually, a Reform Rabbi who 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 came to the Zionist Congress in 1898? A guy called Stephen Wise uh, actually came back so inspired after his meeting with Herzl. He founded an organization, one of which, two organizations actually. One is the AZM, and the other is the Zionist Organization of America, which actually wasn't there in 1897 because it was founded yeah. after 1898. I didn't hear your answer. How, but, how was your Judaism not, in not pro Sorry. Israel, and it is now? <laughs> I'm trying to answer you. Because at the core of our Zionism <coughs> is the notion of a Jewish and democratic state, which stands for three things. Collective responsibility to the Jewish people, that we're all responsible for one another. Reimagining what it means to be Jewish in the Jewish state. And a third thing that I haven't heard from many of my other slates is that is uh, the rights of minorities in Israel. Not only should Israel be a Jewish and democratic state, but we should follow what the Torah teaches us, that we should love the stranger in our midst because we are strangers in the land of Egypt, that we should take care of the powerless in society, the ger al-manav yatom, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. And I think that anyone who does anything to jeopardize Israel's character, either as a Jewish state or as a democratic state, is dealing in danger. I am very critical of those who are willing to get rid of Israel's Jewish state, and I, Jewish character, and I want to be equally critical of those who are jeopardizing Israel's character as a democracy. Because if it's a democracy, if it's not a democracy, I think it therefore can't also be Jewish. Okay, two questions for you. Uh, say, of the three things you said, mm. which 10 years ago, 20 years, was not part of the reform movement? No, they were always part of the reform movement. Yeah, so you, I, I'll say the question again. Yeah. 
And by the way, maybe you didn't mean it. Maybe it was just something that came, comes out of you. Yeah. Maybe, in fact, it's not that you believe Reform Judaism is now more pro-Israel than it was before. Because you haven't given me one example of how you are now more Zionist what? than well, the, the reform, reform movement was before. The movement was anti-Zionist. Just a minute. We're not talking about the 1950s. We're not talking about the 1950s. We're not talking about the 1950s. Excuse me. We're not talking about the 1950s. I assume Josh means some time in the recent history here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I would say that we took a step in 2018. Our board unanimously affirms the Jerusalem program, the ideological platform of the world. And it wouldn't have done that before. Probably not. And what aspect of the Jerusalem program would it not? Oh, I don't know. I just, I just don't think it was. Uh, it, it, it wasn't relevant. The Jerusalem to program idea. says that anybody who accepts it is yeah. it agrees to settlement of the country. Yeah. Does the reform movement agree to that concept? Yes. We should settle the country. Yes, in our. This and what is the country to you? <laughs> okay. Um, in the platform of the Central Conference of American Rabbis in 1999, we actually included the word Aliyah for the first time, which is a big deal. And so we said, yes, as, as an expression of our Jewish identity, we encourage Aliyah. And I'm proud to have made Aliyah myself and lived in Israel and served in the army and helped to grow our reform movement. As we say, Yamat Zafonda, you know, Negba, Kedma, Venegba. Um, that we in all are, four directions. Right, in all four directions across the country. You know so what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, right when now. you say the country, you're referring both sides of the green line or only one side? I'm referring to the state of Israel. There's the recognized borders of the state of Israel. Okay, you're only talking about inside the, inside the green line. So I, I, think that the, I think the green line is a problematic definition. I didn't create it. I said, but you it, is, it is the border of Israel at the moment. <laughs> it, it, it's actually, it's actually not, not the internationally recognized border. They don't border. recognize borders now. Oh, yeah, what's the, Kaviri, Kaviri, excuse Kaviri. Me, excuse yeah, me. what's the internationalized border? What's the internationally recognized border? The Ellie, no, no, Ellie. Ellie what's the international? Ellie, 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 what's the internationally recognized border? There isn't. There is not. Okay, a consensus. but everybody understands. You see, this is a game. This is not appropriate by you guys. Everybody knows what Israel looks like. Yeah. What the border has been from 1949 to 1965, and the issue we're grappling with as a modern Jewish community is: What do we do with land? which we came into control no, but, with but in a defensive from war. 40, now what Josh from is saying is, to excuse me, Josh is, say, that that's Josh is saying that for the order. reform movement, for Artsa, settling the country does not mean for him the land that came under Israeli control after 67. And he has every right to that position, and it's interesting for the audience to know that. And then what would be interesting to know of the four of you, do you but I'm define sorry, I'm, the country? I'm, I'm sorry, the same we, we cannot say we cannot say that the real borders are only from 40, 48 to sixty five. Because, you, because you otherwise, the country, when we speak of the United States, then maybe we're only talking about the thirteen colonies. Oh please, before the Congress oh, of the rest. It's so silly. You cannot, Ellie, no, 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 you Ellie, cannot I'm limit the country. When you say the country, you cannot limit the country, you the country, the country up to what a are you year. talking about? You when you say the country, what are you talking about? I'm talking about from the Golan Heights down to the Negev, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. Fine. Right. When you talk about the country. I do not include the Shtachim, the occupied territories, and I do talk about the Green Line. Okay. What do you, talk, what do you mean I, when I'm country? talking about the, the full, full area from, from, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, and, and actually it really should have gone beyond that, because well, I'm yes. talking about the mandatory area, which was, was guaranteed under international law to the Jewish people, which has never been revised. Fine. And, and Yonatan. We include all of Judea and Samaria okay. as part of this. Okay. And realm. all I'm saying is, it's not about whether one of you is right and one of you is wrong. It's just interesting for the audience to hear that you have different philosophies about what the country is and what Jews can should be settling at the, the present BDS, time. I have my hand up a long time. No, because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted Josh. I'm sorry. I just want to clarify that a lot of discussion around land, I think, is missing a point because we're also talking about people. Right. Right. 2.5 million Palestinians living there. So the question that I would ask is, what do you want to do? 
do we want to just annex people and have them become under our rule perpetually and not give them rights to vote? Or do we want to give them full rights to vote in dem democracy, which could risk our Jewish majority in the state? So I, I, think, I think that's a central question. It's not about land for me. I read the Bible. Trust me. I love it. I tour guide. I do all those things okay, in Israel. I promise, I promise you, if is, there's time, oh, yeah. we'll talk about what all of you <clears throat> think should be done in terms of the two-state solution and solving the problem okay. with the Palestinians. Yeah. But that's not the issue here. Very quickly. Okay, exactly. quickly, on, on the BDS issue, which I, I've been waiting I, to respond to. to respond. First of all, Herzl, in his book, The Jewish State, one of the reasons why he thought he wanted to have a Jewish state was because of boycotts at that time. Boycotts is an incredible evil. It, it, it undermines the, the, the livelihood of, of the Jewish people. You don't have to also divest and sanction. Boycotts is enough. In fact, the first action taken by, the official action taken by the Nazis against the Jewish people was a boycott. And we should bear that in mind. Fine. And, 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 and what the, the, the uh, anti-BDS or combating BDS resolution that we passed at the World Zion, Zionist Congress in, two, in uh, 2015 to 2016 includes a combating boycotts okay. against, against Judea and Samaria. And the lab, I'll tell you, the labor, the labor uh, somebody who was a former labor MK reminded people, stood up in favor of our resolution, of ZOA's resolution, and said, you know, oh, what, are you going to boycott Ariel University, which is an oasis of peace where, where Jews and, and Arabs learn together? What, are you going to boycott Ma'ale Ma well, Adamim? We understand and, your position. Okay. I would also like to point to something no, else. No, I have to, it's I'm not, sorry. It's not just APN, it's, Hatikva, it's a Hatikva. We're moving, we're moving you had so, a question. It's a Hatikva yeah. slate itself. Now, hold on, I'll get to you. We'll come to you. Thank you. I promise. Can I just answer, I mean, not everybody's... Not yet. Go ahead. Otherwise, it's... This okay. is well, going to be a quagmire. Saying. I think you made your position almost clear on this issue. No, I, I made it very clear. Yeah. yeah. I just want to I just want to relate to something that Josh mentioned, which I felt like he was Josh. I felt like you were coming into this uh, cool de sac and then made a U turn. You mentioned something about the values and about economy and about taking care of the Geri Atom and Almana, about the needy in society, and it led me to a question that Israeli society and income inequality has become a major issue right. within Israel today. Sure. And I want to understand from, from you and from others, as, as far as you want to comment, including aging Holocaust survivors and other terrible situations we face within Israel, how much of a priority should this be I think for the world's Jewish Congress? Thank you for asking. I think it's a huge priority because the institutions that we're dealing with, the World Zionist Organization, Kenneth Kaimit Israel, the JNF, and the Jewish Agents for, for Israel are deeply invested in what we call welfare programs, or social welfare programs. Um, and I think that if we're going to help uh, say where those budgets should go, we have to start living according to our values. And that's taking care of people, that's chesed, that's uh, living up to what we stand for, that's living up to what I learned in the Torah and what I try to teach from our Torah values. That's deeply connected. Our reform movement in Israel has a, uh, as a humanitarian wing called Karen Bekavod, where we're out there, not just for our own movement, but for the entire city, dealing with underprivileged, dealing with poor, dealing with victims of disasters, victims of terror, all those things um, that we're doing. And that's at the fiber of who we are as a movement. And okay, that's where our then, Zionism okay, really plays out. Okay, I have only a because we're grabbed by the clock. <clears throat> and I promise, I I you, promise you, Yonatan, you have a chance to speak. Yes, and then we're going to take a break. So you go ahead. Yeah. So... I'm a, I'm a college student, so I actually see BDS on college campuses very often, and they're a very hateful, anti-Semitic movement. And BDS is the acronym that stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. So let's just be very clear about what it is. It includes boycotts. And right here on live TV, Nomi from the Hatzikva slate stated that people on her slate do support some forms of boycott, and that does not sound in compliance to the Jerusalem program to me because according to the Jerusalem program, you cannot support the BDS movement. And on live TV, she just said that some of her people on her, on her, on her slate do support it. And that doesn't sound very kosher to me. So you I get just wanted to, to be very clear on that. Okay, fine. I, I want to answer uh, both to my I don't right have, and my left. Well, if you want to answer to me, I'll, I'll do it if you, when we come back. No, no. If you want to answer Yonatan, you I'm can do so. I'm going to answer him, and it's the but same I, thing. I, because we everybody... are grabbed by the clock. Okay, so I have a minute? You have... I'll give you a minute. Okay. 
So uh, uh, Elliot Buddy talked about that we are hiding behind semantics here, and, and then we heard over here about the BDS movement on campus. The BDS movement on campus is a racist campus that is anti-Israel. You asked about anti-Israel. That is an anti-Israel movement. What we talk about, particularly as progressive Jews, who actually work with many groups on the left, is that we are people that teach people and work and work with people on that who are maybe thinking and hearing about BDS to see that that is not what is um, for Israel. If you believe in Israel, you do not support that movement. So people who sit on the progressive slate and work and defend Zionism and say that you can be a Zionist and realize that there are problems with annexation, that there are problems in the state of Israel, does not mean that the option is BDS or bust. There are ways to work within Israel, within the American Jewish movement, within the world movement, to say, I am a, I am a Zionist, I believe in the safest and most secure Israel in the world. That there are, we talked to Elia Buddy mentioned that we are hiding behind soldiers and hurting them. We also have the support. There are that we all know that there are Israelis, that there are members of all levels of government that work in the army, on grassroots, on the ground, that also believe that we need to get out of the Shtachim. We need to stop the creeping annexation in order for us to have the safest Israel. There, okay. A minute. We're going to take a break and we'll come back. And it's, by the way, the five of you are fabulous. This is just what I wanted. Um, I will say this to you and just give this thought. Maybe, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about this for a moment. I don't believe any of the five of you don't want there to be a safe and secure Israel. And as I listen to you, Josh, I'm saying to myself, does Josh think that Artsa and the Reform Movement has a monopoly on chesed? Are you suggesting that the other four people representing other four groups do not share your compassion and your care for the orphan and the widow and the stranger in our midst because I'm now telling this to all of you. That kind of rhetoric is what is prevalent throughout the Jewish world. Be very careful that what you want to say is my group is the group that cares about safety, security, and Jewish values. I know all of you, every one of you, is a deeply committed Jew and a deeply committed Zionist. We will continue. There's so many other questions and we'll only have an hour back. We're gonna take just a few minute break. You have the break too. We're gonna to share some other information about JBS with you. Then we'll continue with part two of the first World Zionist Congress Election Forum right here on JBS, please stay with us. Shalom. I'm Michael Oren, and you're watching the Jewish Broadcasting Service, expanding Jewish understanding, celebrating all things Jewish. If you care about Israel and Jewish life today, there's a beautiful Jewish cultural channel just for you. JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, where you'll see daily news from and about Israel, in-depth interviews with Jewish figures from across the Jewish spectrum. Have a front row seat at the marvelous programs of the 92nd Street Y and at outstanding lectures, conferences, and performances with multiple Jewish films and documentaries every week, even twice daily programming for children. Learn to read Hebrew, study the Talmud, and if you're unable to attend a synagogue in person, JBS televises live Sabbath services every Friday night. And it's all free of charge. JBS, expanding Jewish understanding, celebrating all things Jewish. Take part in Shabbat services every week here on JBS with a Kabbalat Shabbat service every Friday night before sundown from the Hampton Synagogue in West Hampton Beach, New York and with Central Synagogue's Friday night and Saturday morning services at 6 p.m. on Friday and on Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m. If you're unable to attend a synagogue in person, you can still celebrate Shabbat with the entire Jewish community right here on JBS, celebrating all things Jewish.
שלום. I'm Dr. Ruth Westheimer, and the only place on television where you can watch the wisdom of Dr. Ruth Westheimer is right here on JBS, expanding Jewish understanding, celebrating all things Jewish. Hi, I'm Rabbi Mordechai Becher, uh, exploring concepts of the Talmud each week with Dimensions of the Duff on JBS, expanding Jewish understanding. I don't think that anybody today anymore asks the question why JBS is important. I think history will record that you created outlets of teaching and touching Jewish souls and beyond the Jewish community in an unbelievable way. In a world where every now and then we get a little Jewish this or a little Jewish that, it's a place where Jews can find their home, they can find their roots. It gives us a Jewish lens on everything that interests us challenges us, confuses us, and frankly worries us. And I want a place that I can turn to that makes me think and makes me care. The Jewish people in America need a profound voice that needs to be heard by Jews and non-Jews about the status of Jews in America, the fate of Israel, the problems of anti-Semitism, all those things are encapsulated in JBS. From the culture, to the movies, to the tefillah, to the songs, to your teaching of Hebrew, and to what we're talking about, which is what are the existentialist issues of today. A lot of us do good work, a lot of organizations, but if we didn't have a JBS, if we didn't have an outlet where people could hear and see what we do, it wouldn't be as effective. I have learned so much from you and from JBS. This is my go-to station. The greatest danger we face is not all the enemies arrayed against us. It's apathy, ignorance, and indifference. JBS stands against them. We hope you'll support JBS as generously as possible by sending a tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Or you can make a tax-deductible donation online by visiting the Jewish Broadcasting Service website at www.jbstv.org and clicking on the Donate button at the top of the home page. Become part of the JBS family and help sustain the State of Israel and the future of American Jewry. We thank you for your kind support. And now we continue with the first ever World Zionist Congress Election Forum. Welcome back to JBS's coverage of a World Zionist Congress Election Forum in partnership with AZM, the American Zionist Movement. Um, I have a question that I, I'm just dying to hear all five of you address, but I want it to be very narrow in your answers. Ellie, I want to begin with you. Donald Trump, good for Israel, bad for Israel? The best for Israel. Why? Because he supports Israeli government's positions. He has uh, recognized Golan Heights as a sovereign Israeli territory. He's now recognizing the Jordan uh, uh, Valley as a sovereign Israeli territory. He recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He moved the embassy there. And he has done so much for Israel and for the Jewish people that not only I, but the Israeli government itself thinks that Donald Trump was the best ever president that the United States could have had for Israel. Nomi, Donald Trump, good or bad for Israel? Donald Trump is bad for Israel, and Donald Trump is bad for Jews, and I would even argue that Donald Trump is bad for the America and go for the trifecta. Um, why is he bad for Israel? First of all, I don't think that Donald Trump understands foreign policy. I don't think that Donald Trump understands the Middle East. Uh, I think that Israel and the Middle East has been the downfall of many presidents in understanding, and everyone thinks that they can do it, but his how he has come in uh, in his appointment as the ambassador to Israel, which was someone who was not someone who can be an ambassador. He is not of a diplomatic 
uh, 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 doesn't look and doesn't act as, as a diplomat should look, particularly in a region like that, in, in his support for policies, uh, annexation, in the talk of the peace plan, how one can put out a peace plan like he's just done that doesn't even recognize that actually there have to be other players at the table. You don't offer a peace plan. You don't put out a menu and say you only have one course. That's what has to be done. There needs to be other people sitting at the table. Uh, so I don't think he understands that. Uh, I don't think he is good for Jews here. I think he has led to anti-Semitism in this country. I think how he has responded uh, to things from as early as Charlottesville shows what happens in his connections to the far right wing. Um, I, would also, I would argue in um, how he has been okay when people have come after Soros. Um, how you can say that somebody is good for the Jewish people when somebody comes after somebody for being a Jew and somebody have money and his comments that he made at the IAC. So no, absolutely not. Boy, you just heard two people give us about as diametrically, uh, diametric opinions as possible. It is very representative of what the American Jewish community is today. But there's one best, Elia Body. Trump is the best, and know me, he's the worst. Didn't say okay, the worst. not I the worst. The worst. I said he's bad. He's for bad. All. Okay, he's bad. I don't think we need to have okay. a competition Fine. on no, the worst. No. Liz, the worst, the worst was the best. Donald Trump, good or bad for Israel? I would agree. Also agree that he was. He's been the best president ever for Israel. Um, recognition the of the Golan Heights, which is something that the ZOA worked on for many years. Uh, transferring the embassy to Jerusalem, Israel's capital, recognizing that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. Again, something that the ZOA has worked on since 1995. We were involved in... Okay, all the things that the Ellie said. Act. No, I have, more, I have more. I actually have more to add to the list. Um, uh, he also cut the uh, Palestinian Authority funding. We, we used to give $500 million a year to the Palestinian Authority. They were turning around and using $350 million of that to pay terrorists to murder Jews. Um, and to incentivize that's the murder the of Jews. That's the pay for slay. Uh, and the pay for uh, absolutely, that's correct. The pay for slay payments, he, he stopped that. He said, we're not going to fund you while you're continuing to pay terrorists to murder people. Um, the Iran deal, you know, which was one of the worst deals ever, and he stopped that. Um, he also, a very important issue is that he supported, he had which re recently happened, um, he issued an executive order supporting, including Jewish students under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VI. That's something that ZOA has had been working on for many years. We worked on it for six years just to get the civil rights, uh, to get the education department to, um, to, acknowledge, to acknowledge that and its regulations, and he has strengthened that. He has strengthened our ability to go after people who harass Jewish students and pro-Israel students on college campuses, and that's extremely important. Um, he also, he, he, there were many uh, good aspects, I don't, uh, some, many good aspects for his, of his peace plan, I don't necessarily agree with everything, but among uh, other things, he is, is not going to dis dispossess the 750,000 Jews who live over the Green Line, and by the green, way, the Green Line is not a border, it's not an internationally recognized border, the, the <laughs> agreements that set that, that, that the, the Green Line up uh, where, where the armistice agreements between Jordan and Israel and Egypt and Israel and they specifically say that it's a, it's, it's, it's a line and it's without prejudice. There's no recognition of that border, I mean, that, that line. I have to interrupt um, you. you okay, he also, he also, okay, I, uh, can I add two more items? Okay. Real also, quick. Uh, also in, in, the, uh, in this uh, proposal, he supports the right of Jews to pray on the Temple Mount, which is very important. Um, and his, I, want, I want to also say that the Char, this whole idea about Charlottesville is a total lie. He sta he's actually, he, when he spoke about two people being good, good, two groups being good groups, he was not including neo-Nazis and, and, and the white supremacists. And he stated two, maybe two sentences later in the same, in this a exact same paragraph that I'm absolutely not talking about neo-Nazis, I'm not talking about white supremacists, and they have to be condemned completely. I condemn them completely. And he has said that a million times, and yet this lie persists that he, that, that he, he supported them. Okay. Yonatan, Trump, good or bad for Israel? He has done many good things for Israel, and Khairut being nonpartisan and pluralistic, we do not endorse one candidate or party over the other. I'm going to ask you to endorse him. Just want to know what you think is good for He has for done many good things, especially all the things that Liz just mentioned. And Has he done some bad things? His Trump peace proposal, we do not agree with it because it is an all or nothing deal. And while there's many good parts of the deal that we like, there's some parts of the deal that are deal breakers. Fair enough. And, one of, and, and I'd just like to say one more comment quickly. Nomi mentioned the IAC conference, the Israeli-American Council conference, tr uh, Trump's comments that he said there. I'm a student activist, Nomi. I went to the conference, and his comments were taken out of context. I actually was there, and I heard him. Okay. Josh?
Trump, good or bad for Israel? I think Donald Trump is, President Trump is highly problematic for Israel, and let me list a few reasons why I think so. First of all, let me state that I was in favor of the moving the embassy to Jerusalem. I'm in favor of recognizing the Golan Heights as uh, part of sovereign Israel after it was annexed in 1981. However, what I feel about Trump is that I think he's totally unpredictable. We don't know if he's going to wake up tomorrow and totally change his mind about where he is. We don't know how he's going to relate to the next Israeli prime minister, whoever that might be. Okay, we don't know. If you pay attention to his campaign in 2016, the morning before he spoke at the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, okay, he made a campaign promise to Congress that wasn't picked up later, that he was going to curb foreign aid in general. Okay? He has been pretty good about coming through on his campaign promises. So I'm worried when that shoe is going to drop and he's going to start cut, cutting front as a sort of isolationist ideology when he's going to start cutting front to Israel also. As we can see, he totally, totally abandoned the Kurdish people. And what, what, what's to stop him from doing that to the Jewish people as well? We can see that there has been, whether or not his marks were taken out of context, read the ADL report that there has, is it a coincidence that there has been a drastic uptick in anti-Semitic attacks since Donald Trump has come into power. Right? So I think that he is highly problematic, um, and I think that it's a, it's, it's a big problem, his erratic behavior and his lack of foreign policy experience. Um, the ambassador that he chose for Israel, we openly opposed uh, due to his highly partisan nature, one way. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to elections. Okay. By the way, the audience now has heard what all five of you say about Trump, only because you began. You know, you heard some pretty strong things, reasons why people think he has been bad for Israel. What would you answer them? They're living in a fantasy. He hasn't done anything bad for Israel. Anything. Everything Are you that he has done. Josh is has worried been about so what he might Israel. do in the future. Well, everybody might do in the future things. I mean, any other crazy person can wake up the next day. Clinton had no foreign like policy, foreign, foreign policy uh, experience. Jimmy Carter had no foreign policy experience. Ronald Reagan had no foreign policy experience. We cannot judge him. If you want to judge a president, then judge all the presidents equally. He's erratic. He has, a, he has an interesting behavior. That's who he is. And so far, I'd rather have somebody who's erratic on my side than having somebody who is erratic who is not on my side. What about Josh's comment that there is an increase in anti-Semitism? Do you blame Trump? And not at all. I blame Obama because, the, because the, in the beginning of the incitement of anti-Israel feeling was from President Obama from the first day that he said there has to be a daylight between Israel and the United States. And he allowed politicians, especially in the Democratic Party, like our famous three or four uh, squad uh, group and uh, congresswomen, who dare to speak against Israel, to badmouth Israel, to be anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic, some of them. Why? Because they were given permission by President Obama. Obama opened up the season against Israel. Were you? Okay. By the way, we, again, we're going to go to some other questions in a moment, but the last one having to do with this American political scene. Josh, there are... I speak to American Jews all the time who voted Democrat their entire life. They're concerned that there's an erosion of support for Israel within the uh, Democratic Party. And we have a quote that we're going to put up on the screen, a tweet by Bernie Sanders, which is now being used everywhere, <coughs> where Bernie Sanders says, basically, he's not going to, he is not going to attend APEC. He says, the Israeli people have the right to live in peace and security. So do the Palestinian people. I remain concerned about the platform AIPAC provides for leaders who express bigotry, meaning Netanyahu, and oppose basic Palestinian rights. For that reason, I will not attend their conference. Two quick questions, and again, try to answer it as quickly as you can. Are you at all concerned about an erosion of support in the Democratic Party? How do you feel when you hear Cortez or we feel Talib and you hear Omar and then you hear members of the Democratic Party who are running for president, both Sanders and Warren, say they're not going to attend APEC and you are on your way to APEC? Yeah, so I think we were openly, our movement was openly uh, critical of Sanders' choice and his decision to make, and we, I posted that on my Facebook, and uh, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, the president of the URJ, also tweeted about that 
as I think you played earlier on the JBS role, um, I, I would say this. I would like the Democratic nominee to be pro-Israel. We have a long history of Democrats being pro-Israel. Of course, we have Democrats and Republicans and across the entire spectrum within the reform movement. So I just want to say this, that of course I'm concerned. I'm concerned by both. I'm concerned that the total defunding of the Palestinians by the Trump administration puts Israel in a precarious, a precarious position of having to now take care of all these people that were being funded uh, from, from outside. Right? That's not in Israel's interest to do. So I think that Sanders should come to APAC. I think he should use it as a platform to say what he wants to say and to have that exchange and have that discussion. Um, I think if you look at three Congress Congress congresswomen or representatives or four representatives out of 235, okay, I think that you'll see a staunchly pro-democratic both, uh, that, that, and I think that we should all agree on the importance of bipartisan support. Okay, for but the you're not worried then about an erosion in the Democratic Party? Not as much. I'm worried about both. Okay. okay. You want to um, Yeah, so you, um, Josh uh, mentioned that uh, the this the disfunding of the aid to the Palestinians would put Israel at risk. But at Khairut, we're all about the safety of the Jewish people. That's why we put out the security handbook. That's why we do Krav Maga trainings. And that's why we empower Jews to protect themselves. And we know that it is wrong when you have a government like the Palestinian Authority saying, we're going to use our humanitarian aid to fund terrorism against Jews. And so we know that it's wrong to continue giving money to them. So can you please explain why you think it would be harmful to Israel sure, sure. for the discontinuation of the money funding the killing of Jews. Yeah, because that money didn't go there. And so if you start taking apart the Augusta Victoria Hospital, all the Krav Maga in the world is not going to help the Israeli taxpayer who has to now take care of those people where they were previously being funded by USAID. Why are their leaders not taking care of them? Okay. They were. They were why just, just like Israel. Why doesn't Israel exist on its own without the help of the United States? It doesn't. It receives a healthy... Um, a healthy foreign aid package that, by the way, Which is Barack Obama beneficial. negotiated $38 billion. It's Which called is the mutually Memorandum beneficial. Of what are the Palestinians mutually contributing to Israel? Yeah. Are you saying that's mutually beneficial? <laughs> I don't think that's the point. I Israel think allows them to work yeah. within Israel? But you need to let Josh answer. You're right. So, so I think that, that and, and this is not, I didn't invent this, by the way. Look at the Israeli government who, who wrote about this, who didn't want to openly criticize the President of the United States, but they said, listen, this is, this is a disaster for us. Gaza is a humanitarian disaster right now, and they desperately need that funding, or else Israel's going to stop. I, I just want to stop you there, because yeah, you mentioned Gaza. UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency that's taking care of refugees, that's been tasked yes. with this mission, has reached a situation where you have today on their rosters 5.5 million refugees. The um, U.S. administration on the roster 5.5 million. On the roster, you have 5.5 million, and the U.S. administration decided to defund UNRWA in 2018. Right. Do you think that decision is harmful for Israel? I think it is harmful for Israel. Now, let me be clear. I'm well aware of the UNRWA facilities, like hospitals and schools, that were stages for terrorism. Okay, I'm well aware of Qassam rockets being shot from the rooftops of schools and hospitals and school buildings books. using human shields and all that. Trust me, I served the in the... School I did, books. The school I, books. I, I, yeah, the, this is different. I, I served in the IDF spokesperson's unit. Okay, like, trust me, I, I, I could talk for hours about that. What I'm worried is that someone has to pick up the pieces, and Israel's not going to let those sick people just remain sick. They're going to take care. They're going to go to Hadassah Hospital Dr. instead Dr. of Augusta Inat Victoria. Wilf, Dr. Anat yeah, Wilf, the co-author of the book, The War of Return, indicates Inat Wilf, uh, that it's not only Kay. about former K, correct, for labor, indicates that it's not only about sheltering um, warriors or Hamas terrorists in the course of warfare, but also the continuous indoctrination of Palestinians in the direction of conflict, thus perpetuating conflict and undermining a mission. So, so let me ask you a question. Now that, they've been now that they've been defunded, all of a sudden are the Palestinians now, oh gosh, you're right, thanks for showing us the light, and now we're going to be supportive. No, the situation is, you know, is, is, is so much worse now. Okay, but and, let, and, let and the why, did, why did Trump please plan say, why should, our, we say we need why should our taxpayers' yeah. money fund yeah. them? Let the European fund them. Let this Arab yeah. countries yeah. fund yeah. them. Yeah. So like the yeah. Yeah. We don't yeah. 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 We don't have to be. I don't want to pay for my taxpayers. I don't want to support the money of each other. Please terrorist organization who Eli, undermined the state of Israel. I'm glad we've now become Jews? an Israeli political talk show. Okay, <laughs> great. Or a democratic one. <laughs> right. Let's go. Well, that's, that's it. Look, the, the, the situation is not better now, and someone needs to deal with this. Okay, okay. you've made the point. 
So, yeah. First of all, Liz. Th there should not be 5.5 million refugees. It's ridiculous. They're, they're only, they're, if you had a real uh, refugee program, like all the other refugee programs <coughs> in the world, the idea is res resettling. Uh, they should be resettled in the countries where they are. Somebody who's been in Lebanon for generation after generation, who was never bor not born in Israel, is no longer a refugee. The actual number of real refugees is about uh, Palestinian refugees, so-called refugees, is about twenty thousand. They're not even we're not even refugees to begin with, because they left on their own accord at at the uh, insistence of the Ar of the Arab League. Uh, they, they, the Israelis asked them to stay. There are many Arabs who stayed in Israel and became Israeli citizens. Um, they, they're not even refugees by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and also, the, the UNRWA budget. One of the best, one of the many great things that Trump did was to cut the uh, to, to to eliminate the UNRWA budget because this is a bloated bureaucracy that's teaching hate. Uh, that's refusing to resettle. The idea of refugees is you resettle them where they are. You don't keep them in perpetual refugee status in order to be a thorn in Israel's side. Okay. So in favor of okay. okay. Again, I'm going to ask you a question. Simple answer. If a Jew says to you, the most important Nobody issue for me in a presidential election is Israel, is that Jew making a mistake? Is that American Jew making a mistake or not? Yes, because a person has to look around and see where he lives or she lives and seek also the peace of the country that they live in. There should be shlom, bishlom haaretz, as the Navi Yirmiya said, that we ought to seek for the welfare of the country that we live in. And so we need to we need to put together what's best for Israel and what's best for the United Very States. Nice. No, and we, in my opinion, Donald Trump represents the best of both. Yes, I understand. Wait, no. I didn't get to answer the last question. And, any question you okay, want. Okay, so but I'm just because <laughs> I think Liz just talked about transferring. Uh, uh, about, no, I was talking about resettling. Palestinian refugees where they are in you Lebanon and Jordan. But you um, talked about uh, the ones in Gaza, so I'm just trying to be clear about what we were talking well, about. I don't think you were su suggesting moving I, Palestinians, were I, I was talking about resettling the people who are the, the, the Palestinian refugees, you know, I, yes. I, use, I outside, use that in quotes. Outside of outside Israel. Outside, yeah. who are in, in, you know, you don't maintain them, you don't maintain them, right. their okay. refugee Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, are, I, I, I just want to come back to, and, that, and I also you didn't ask me about the Democratic Party, and I just want to say that as as Josh said too, I'm I'm you know uh, um, I'm worried about some of the racist members of the Republican Party just as well as I'm worried about some stuff. And one of the benefits about being a progressive slate and having connections to the progressive uh, politicians in this country is that we're working to educate to understand better because sometimes the issues are not as clear as they may be to us okay, to do I, that. So okay, now, I, okay, now I find that no, your question man, about I find, I find that answer to be misdirecting. 70% or more of American Jews are Democrats. They voted Democrat their whole life. Many Jews, they're not going to vote Republican. They don't like Republicans. They think Republicans don't have the right values. That's not what's interesting. No, but what's interesting is you, as a lifelong Democrat, does it bother you that there are signs of anti-Semitism inside the Democratic Party. Do you feel there's erosion? You you don't so have to, I, but do you or not? No, I think I think I'm trying to answer you the question. Really, I I feel that first of all, I want to say this. I think that just because you criticize a policy of another country, that doesn't mean that that's erosion. I also criticize the policy of the Israeli government. So if my congressman or my senator comes to me and says, what do you think of this issue and how should I support? Because I'm being told that I can't talk about um, occupation no, no, or by, annexation. But by, by, by no, calling I'm Israel racist question, and by calling the Jews, by the Benjamin, that's well, different. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Different. Hold you could, hold you could the disagree with the policy. Yes, the reality you is what you're referring to. Yes, yes, yes. What you're referring Jews, to, yes, yes, yes. Racist, you're referring to has different. nothing to do with policy. Nobody would disagree that you have a right to, to disagree about policy. No, but you were talking policy. about racism or the erosion of support. Erosion in of support, And I'm yes. saying to you that, that I do not believe that because there are, uh, there are questionings about how money is spent uh, in Israel, which at the J Street conference, by the way, was asked to all of the leading candidates who attended to talk about this issue. That doesn't mean that they don't support the state of Israel. Okay, so you feel, so there's, no, you feel there's no erosion. Now, so to back to right? your question. Correct. Okay. Back to your question, uh, which... What happens if an American Jew... If a, what would you say to an American Jew who says, my number one issue in a presidential campaign is to vote for... is Israel? So you're... I'm going to tell you the exact answer that I gave to somebody the other day. 
Israel is important. Women's rights are important. The right to choose for me is important. As a foreign policy person, making sure that there is a president or a party that understands what it means to have a secretary of state and a department and diplomatic and ambassadors in all those states, those are important. Issues of health care are important. Uh, issues of equality are important. Uh, issues of how we uh, treat uh, uh, somebody who is under, more pr underprivileged than I am. Those are the issues that are important. And what I need to do is stand there and make a list and look at all those issues. I am not going to support a candidate who does not believe and defend the state of Israel. Okay. But I'm also not going to support a candidate who defends the state of Israel and says to me that I don't have the right to choose. Okay. And so what you're saying is, <clears throat> by the way, you know there are people who do say they have a number one priority. There are many people who say, I will not vote for any president who does not support Roe v. Wade. Everything else to me is secondary. Correct. And, and there, are Jews, there are Jews who say, the most important issue to me is the welfare of the state of Israel. And before any other issue, for me, they say, I want to know that that president is, from my perspective, going to support the state of Israel. For you, it's only one of many, correct? Right. And what I would also say to that person <coughs> or to anybody, or as you want to come back to the Democratic Party, is that go, go speak to the candidates, get involved with the candidate that you believe best represents you on those issues. Fair I enough. don't want to be on a one Fair issue. Enough. I'm not a one issue gal. Josh, somebody says, Israel is my number one issue. I vote in a presidential election based on who I think is best for Israel. You say? I would worry about someone who says also the opposite. And so that's, that, that's a big problem. I think what Nomi and Ellie said, I, I think we, hopefully I think we can all agree about, of course, all these things that come from our tradition, but we have to worry about the local issues first. And I don't want to, Israel to be such a wedge issue that someone could say, well, I'd like that candidate except for Israel, so I'm not going to vote for them. Uh, and so I worry about that Why not? dichotomy. What? By the way, I don't believe that if there were, if there were a candidate who was actively anti-Israel, who believe, for example, that the United States should n not give it military, f military funding. Aid, yeah. My guess is you would not be comfortable with that candidate. That's right. Yeah, okay. we are openly critical of those who have yes. campaigned so far on the position of possibly curbing funding to you know, foreign aid packages. To okay, Israel. Liz, very quickly. As other countries, too. Same question. Yeah. Liz? Okay, I, I didn't have a chance to answer the erosion question, so can I answer that quickly also? Very um, quickly. No, no, I didn't. No, I, didn't. No, I, didn't. I was the only one that did not. No, of course. Um, the, um, the erosion, the numbers have really increased. I'm very concerned about it because we believe in bipartisanship also. Um, I'm very concerned about the erosion in the Democratic Party. You know, there used to be wonderful Democrats for, for, for Israel. It's hard to find one at the moment. Um, the Ga for instance, we take a look at the Gaza, the Gaza 54 uh, letter that was written d a decade ago was signed by 54 Democratic, uh, uh, it's an infamous letter criticizing Israel for defending itself on Gaza. Um, uh, and that, that was a decade ago. That was only 54 Democratic congressmen. Now the, now the letters, the anti-Israel letters that are coming out of, out of Congress, you have 107 people signing those. Um, there's a, there has been a real erosion, for instance, you know, okay. the, the object. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, then you know, we also have many more people if, in Congress. Well, so if someone comments. says to you, I'm voting for president based on Israel, you say? I say fine. Fine. And Yonatan. We are nonpartisan and we are all about inclusion. Uh, okay. And Jabotinsky said every individual is a king. And we do not tell people how to vote. And we don't tell them if it's wrong if they vote a certain way. So if someone came to me and said, Israel's my top priority, that's my number one issue, I would say, that's great, that's okay. But if someone said Israel's not my number one issue, I would also say that's okay. And okay. if somebody comes to you and says, I'm going to vote for a president because I care about Roe v. Wade, and that candidate is vehemently not supportive of Israeli policies? Uh, they wouldn't be in line with Khairut, because at Khairut, we support Israeli policies. Not every single policy, but we support being a Zionist. And so if someone supports a candidate that's vehemently Zionist, so it's not I, don't think they I don't think they would associate <laughs> with Khairut. <laughs> At Khairut, we believe in being Zionists. You have to accept that being a Zionist is believing that the Jews have a right to self-determination. So as long as they support way. Israel, the candidates support Israel, they're free to go anywhere they want. We don't tell someone that it's wrong if they vote a certain way. But the way that we at Khairut believe is that p being supportive of Israel should be a component. At least. Okay, there's another I issue I need to get to. <coughs> there are so many we can get to. Yeah. But I want, um, I, 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 I want to, speak about not, the forgive me, forgive, if we have time, yes, yeah, okay. but we don't. At the moment, I want Tisha to raise an issue that is very important to American Jewry. 
Thank you, Mark. So one of the divisive issues in terms of how many non-Orthodox American Jews feel about Israel surround the way in which the Orthodox chief rabbinate refuses to embrace American Jewish pluralism, such as the Reform, Conservative, and Reconstructionist movements. Liz, I want to start with you. How important is this to your party to put non-Orthodox forms of Judaism on an equal footing with Orthodoxy in Israel? For example, should there be an egalitarian section at the Western Wall where men and women can stand together? Should non-Orthodox rabbis and institutions in Israel receive equal funding with Orthodox institutions? I think the priority has to be our rights to our land, because without the land, there's no place for pluralism to exist. And I'm talking specifically about the, uh, the wall. I'm, I'm no, sorry. I'm, 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 talk sorry. I'm talking specifically about the Western Wall, because Woman of the Wall was asked to help in the fight against a UN resolution. A specific question was asked okay, of you. But I, I would, Do you I'm, think there I'm, I'm answering, pluralism I'm trying in Israel? To, I'm trying to answer, I'm trying okay. to answer the question. that's the question. I'm trying to answer the question. Okay, okay please let me continue. They were asked to help in the fight against UN Resolution 2334, which was actually an unlawful attempt to take away every Jew's right to pray at the I'm Western sorry, Wall, and they refused to do so. I must interrupt. This is okay. not the way this works. If you want to answer the question, I'm happy to answer the question. Okay, I, I will answer The question what? is, do you think Jewish pluralism belongs in Israel? Would you work within ZOA coalition for there to be equal funding of reform, conservative, non-Orthodox organizations and institutions and rabbis with Orthodox? Do you think there should be an egalitarian section at the Western Wall? This is real easy. Either you do or you don't. Okay. Real pluralism is the right of every one of the 750,000 Jews living over the Green Line to pray, to pray in the shuls that they want to pray in, and the thousand shuls there. I want to know if they support that, if, if they want to tear up the, their, their rights. Real pluralism is the right of, of every Jew to go up and pray on the Temple Mount. Um, real pluralism would be if Hatikva and Arza stop there, which really an effective boycott of hou and housing discrimination. You know, one of the things that I wanted to bring up and I, I didn't have a chance to before is that it's not just groups on the Hatikva slate; it's the slate itself. The Hatikva slate has, says okay. that they they are they are they say what does Hatikva accomplish? And they say they they uh, accomplish disallowing funding over the Green Line. Um, on the settlements committee. You know, so we, I want you know, to know. I don't well, I, I would like to know. I, know, I, I would like to know. I, I, would, I, I think the real question. You. Mark, I think the real we question. We got five here, bright people here. I think the real question and the, here. And we move from issue to issue, or this can't even be a, a forum Mark, or a discussion. Mark, I think that we're done with that. Okay, I think and the real I, issue is here. What you've answered, what you've answered is, it's not terribly important to you. Go to somebody else. Thank you. Everybody can pray. Everybody can pray there, and then it exists. Fine, fine. Go ahead. I go now uh, to you, Nomi. We wholeheartedly support religious and cultural pluralism in Israel society. We, uh, we also, we have rabbis on our slates. We have people that are involved in synagogue life. I myself am a past president of a conservative synagogue. I look forward to returning to, to laying to fill in and reading Torah at the wall with women of the wall. Life of Torah is also important to us. Progressive Zervants can be observant. Progressive Zionists can be secular. Um, and it's important, it is important to us that rabbis of all denominations should be able to officiate at life cycle events. Uh, it, is, um, it is important to us as well that for the Jews that don't want to be there and want to be on that bus on Shabbat morning in Tel Aviv, that they have that opportunity too to celebrate Shabbat how they want to see Shabbat. And also I just want to add that we stand as well against the vigilant modesty patrols and the other harassments of women that have come out of this as well, which is also a very important part of this pluralism discussion. Thank you, Nomi. Yonatan. Yes, so we encourage people to practice the way they choose to. Um, but regarding funding, equal funding, um, we don't know the numbers of is there equal amounts of Orthodox or Reformed Jews in Israel because why should we be giving equal funding to a group if they're not as representative as another group? So I would like to know that information before I would give you some figures. But there already is a section at the Western Wall that does allow men and women to pray together. So that already does exist. The women of the wall, it seems that they're just making a big fuss. When they say that they want to pray and that's their real mission, when they're bringing Torahs into the bathroom to be able to 
figure out how to go about their mission of praying at the Western Wall, that's not respectful. Bringing a Torah into the bathroom, that is not respectful. And we know how important it is to maintain the character of a Jewish state. I can, I can okay, so figures. no, thank you, Liz. That's figures. okay. It's it's okay. I can give them those figures and what, what the pretensions. Reform, reform and conservative are each about two to three percent percent of Israel, and Orthodox is fifty percent. Okay, the question is proportionally. But, would you, uh, Scott? I'm no sorry, Liz. Sorry, no, you don't have time. Proportionally, would you agree yes, to would, funding? We would say two or three percent to the reform or conservative movement if that figure is no, true. I have no problem That's with what the we would say. And no Ellie, I go to you with the same question. How important is this to your party? Well, uh, as a member of the Sephardic community, I could say we do not have reform, conservative, uh, orthodox, ultra orthodox, Hasidic, uh, uh, reconstructionist, and all the gamut of, 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 of denomination. We are Sephardic, we are Jews. We have observant, very observant, non-observant, a little bit observant. That's who we are. We are very, very exclusive. But when it comes to, to, uh, to milestones and religious uh, activities, they are, they are traditional as it has been for over 3,300 years. So you agree the majority that the chief the should continue well, I mean, I'll, I'll, control I'll get those. There. I'll get there. The majority of the population in Israel is Sephardic. And, uh, and Israel practically lives a Sephardic life, the majority of the population. They go, they go to the synagogue Saturday morning and they go to the football game Saturday afternoon. Uh, or they go to the theater uh, later that day or they go to the beach that day. They respect tradition and that's what we are for. And yes, I do agree that the, 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 the percentage of reform is less than 10% and maybe they should get their, their part. But I have to say, American Jewry has no right whatsoever to pressure Israel to change things based on what they feel, based on what they are. I always tell my reform uh, uh, and progressive uh, 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 colleagues, rabbinical colleagues, go to Israel, become the majority, and control the rabbinate. But as long as you're less than 10%, you cannot control the rabbinate. The rabbinate represents the majority of the, of the Israeli population. And the majority of the Israeli population are traditional Sephardic population, in which they do whatever they do at home. But when it comes to official, traditional, religious milestones, is based on tradition. Josh. And Josh. OK. Um, well, let me clear things up. First of all, our aspiration is to do exactly what Hatikva says, Liot Am Chofshi to be a free people in our land. Now. You're talking about the national anthem. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just making sure. The national sure. anthem. Not of, the not slate. The slate. It's a, yeah. Who's okay with that? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would say the following. First of all, the latest study showed that reform and conservative Jews make up 13% of Israeli society, 8% in the reform movement, 5% in the conservative. That was in 2018. It's grown uh, about a percentage each since. Now, um, in terms of going to the football match on Shabbat, that's great. They can do that except if they can't afford a car or if they're unable to drive themselves, in which case they are stuck at home. So transportation on Shabbat is not only just a religious issue, it's actually a social justice issue, and that's what we're doing. Now, let's take the fact that I can perform a wedding as a rabbi everywhere in the world except for the Jewish state. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad that, I have, that women can be arrested for the simple crime of wearing a talit? And if you want to spread lies about Torah, you can go ahead. But that's, it's, You're just, me a liar. it's just not the, I think what you said was untrue. Yes, so that was not true. What did he say untrue? That, that, we, that we bring Torahs into the bathroom? I'm sorry. Lo, it just did not happen. I'm sorry. That doesn't happen. The fact that we can't pray at the wall. If someone told you you couldn't pray at the synagogue that you want to go to pray in, um, you would be up in arms, and you would be protesting. And in Anybody fact, can that pray at the wall. That's not true. You can be of a different faith, well, and you can go to the wall and pray at the wall. Way. Sure. And, and let me just say, the, the, the Kotel is a symbolic issue. Let's talk about the 300,000 Jews in Israel who can't get married. Let's talk about the fact that a Muslim can't marry a Christian in Israel. Okay? There is no civil marriage in an advanced industrial democracy. Okay, that's a big... Why are 25,000 couples a year leaving Israel to go get married? Why do you think that is? Okay, we have a gigantic, gigantic problem that is eroding Israeli society. In fact, our, I'll just give you an example. Mayor Azari, who's the uh, senior reform rabbi in Tel Aviv, performs about 80 weddings a year. That's like two or three weddings a week, okay? Now, what most Israelis are doing are, in fact, circumventing the chief rabbinate, and they're just doing what's called in Hebrew, yiduim betzibur, or common law marriage, okay? There is an erosion. It's just not simply the case that most Israelis prefer a traditional case. It is not. 
Let me ask you, if most Israelis please. were uh, believing in your path, wouldn't they just vote for the party that's that would go for it? If it's an Maybe, issue but, of numbers? But, Shachar, you probably know better than anyone else that that's not what Israelis vote on, okay? Every now and then there's a fringe so party that comes up, important. like Shinui in the 90s and the Gimlaim in the early 2000s, okay? what's their priority okay. then. Okay. Whatever their priority well, is. Well, they do that. I, um, I think that if you read the platform of many of the Israeli political parties on religion and state, like Yair Lapid just stood up yesterday afternoon and said, of course Israel has to recognize reform and conservative Judaism. Of course, and of course, ac across the span of non-Orthodox Judaism. It is time that we could live as a free people in our land and practice how we want to practice. Do you think Israelis recognize. can differentiate I'm, between what reform conservative is? Israelis? I don't think that matters, actually. Some can, some can't. I don't think that matters. I think what it matters you is see, now... It and doesn't I'm, matter because they want to impose a religious I mean, view well, on Israel. Yeah. Yeah, That's why it I, doesn't matter. I didn't interrupt you. That's why it I doesn't matter because matter. they want to impose I just want to finish by Israel. saying that I'm just... incredibly proud of the fact that at the end of 2019, the Israeli government approved 10 reform rabbis to be officially listed as municipal rabbis. That means that there's a hunger for it. That when you go on the website to see who your rabbi is, you say, oh, okay, you, my, my rabbi can be a woman too. Just as we practice here in the United States. If that's not your personal practice, great, don't go for them. But you have the option. I, I and that's what it's about. Pluralism is not about us trying to replace. I don't want every Jew in Israel to be reform and conservative. Just like uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel said, you wouldn't want to go into an art museum and see the same painting over and over. But we want to have options and we want freedom and we want Israel to be a Jewish state and a democratic state. Okay? I'm not looking for a pure separation of religion and state like we have in, in the United States. What I'm looking for is the ability for us to practice as we want. Just like the Chalutzim came and said we want it to be free. They, if you want to be secular, be secular. If you want to be Haredi, if you want to be uh, you know, ultra-Orthodox, do whatever you want. That's great. But we have to give each people the same option and the same alternatives and the same funding and the same I, and, I and the same laws apply to everyone. I have an important question about yes, this, about, about this pluralism, and it's for Josh and it, and it's for uh, for Nomi. Would you be willing to have funding since you since you both say that you don't want funding over the green line? Would you be willing to have funding and a per land purchased over the green line? Let's say a Ma'ale Adumim or in Ariel to build a reform synagogue. So we were offered that in the 1980s, and we said no, because those are not part of a final status agreement that has been negotiated and established. So you okay? don't really believe in pluralism, so, then? No, you don't really not, believe in pluralism? That's actually, because you were, no, you you were repeating, repeating so the right I, so of, if you of ask, a reformed Jew living asked, in, Ali, in no, Ariel to, to pray in a reform synagogue. That's not what you asked. So you, don't, you don't really believe it's in actually, pluralism. It's actually not at all what you asked. <laughs> Liz, what you asked is, would I approve funding of it? And the answer yeah. was, no. no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but... So he's discriminating against his own... So let me ask you... Okay, you asked the question, people. he answered it. Let, okay. me, let me retort with a question, then. Why don't I hear you talking about minority rights? Do minorities well, what, have rights in Israel? What, what minority rights? I, I mean, I'd like to know... Minority rights. This Let's start with women. Let's start with LGBTQ. Let's start with non-Jews. They have rights in yeah? Israel. Israel is one of the most tolerant Why do you champion the, is most tolerant, champion the rights of minorities, It's the most tolerant, Liz? pluralistic society in the entire, in the entire uh, Middle know. East. You know, this, this is, this is, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy yeah. question. Thank you. Yes. But only I mean, I would, I would, I would, I would not, and I would, I would like knowing to answer the question as to whether she is plural, pluralistic enough. What, what's more important to her, boycotting of Jews living over the green line, or, or and, 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 or in not being pluralistic, or would she take World Zionist Congress funds? or other funds, and fund a reform or reconstructionist synagogue over the Green Line in one of the many okay. beautiful communities. I will, so I, I guess I'm trying to understand why building a synagogue in an, in an occupied, uh, occupied. Uh, in, in, a, in an Jewish annex land. In a, makes that a pluralistic choice. I don't understand that. You can choose where you want to live. And by the way, how lucky for that reformed person who may live in Maile Adumim, they could actually get in their car and drive to a service somewhere else because they can do that on Shabbat. By the way, so that's I, not the question I want to I, talk about. I, I mm -hmm. don't understand. And I'm not weighing in here. Obviously, I, I have feelings about everything. But here, I'm, I'm trying to understand it intellectually. For a reform rabbi, for a leader of the reform movement, to say that you don't want to build a reform synagogue in a Jewish city boggles my mind. Actually, what we've said very clearly is that we want uh, an egalitarian option, a reform synagogue, in every community in Israel. So if the people of Gush Etzion, for instance, want to build a reform synagogue... Well, the, the example Vakashan, was Ariel. Yeah. And what I like to see, World Zionist Congress money build a reform synagogue anywhere in the world. The answer is yes for me. 
And I'm just surprised the answer is not for you. So I think it's highly problematic that we don't want the public money of the Jewish people going to places that are still yet okay. not and under this consensus. Incident, However, incident, incident, if the, we are so close building to a synagogue the end. is a... Well, you is have a, stumbled yeah. into a question. Well, and again, it's please. not fair. We should have done this for three hours. But I'm going to ask for a yes or a no. Yes or a no. World Zionist Congress money should fund institutions on the West Bank. Yes or no? In, institutions on the West Bank? Yes. No. Okay. World Zionist Congress money should fund organizations or institutions on the West Bank. No. World Zionist Congress money should fund West Bank institutions or organizations. My Bikoli, Judea and Samaria, but absolutely yes. Okay. Same question. Yes, we are all about funding Jewish communities. Anywhere. Anywhere. Including the West Bank. Including and especially. Absolutely yes. Okay. And what the audience should understand is they've seen a very powerful difference among these five. There are going to be some of our viewers here who are going to be sympathetic to one or more of your positions. But at least you have, have done a service to the Jewish community by appearing on this program. We didn't get to talk about the two-state solution. We didn't get to talk about the Palestinians. We didn't get to talk about whose <laughs> fault it is. So we'll just have to, you know, maybe we'll have to have you back even after the elections. But I promised, I promised, and we all, you get 30 seconds. You told 30, us nine. I know. Three. No, I told you 60. So now I need to open 30 to 60. I don't have it. I'll give you 30 seconds, meaning a very brief, what you'd love people to take away from this evening about your slate. 30 seconds. As Sephardic Jews, we are a community of inclusiveness. We do not have uh, div divisions by, by denomination. The religious and the non-religious, the observant and non-observant are welcome into our co communities and congregation. Our being, our being born and raised in Middle East, we understand the idiosyncrasy, the culture of our neighbors in Israel. We can bring that to the table. Our tolerance, our inclusivity, inclusivity and our convivance with three different religions during Spain and also in the, in, in the Middle East can really bring that to the table for Thank the World you, Zionist Organization. You're time. Yeah, we do the work that actually affects change by helping to empower Jews around the world to protect themselves. And we really work hard to ensure the sovereignty of the land of Israel, including Judea and Samaria. We're about Jewish unity. We believe in every individual's right. And we believe in including everyone to make sure we're a stronger Jewish nation. So please join Khairud. Beautiful said. Liz. I would like to thank everyone here. And I would also like to thank our, our 27 coalition partners, um, who include Sephardim, uh, Syrians, Persians, Beta Israel, Ethiopians, the full gamut. And I would ask you to go to our website, votezoa.org, to read about all the wonderful organizations, Asia Torah, Hoave Zion, Americans Against Anti-Semitism. I don't have enough time to, to Very list nice. all of I them understand. to, to, to uh, speak about this. Know me. Please vote for us no. to, no. to no. carry out the principle of, that saving Jewish lives everywhere no. in the world comes first. Very good. Know me. Progressive Zionism is not new. Its roots go back to before the creation of the State of Israel. Its message resonates with American Jewry. We are against occupation. We're for this two-state solution, social justice, and protection of democ democratic rights for all Israeli citizens, religious and cultural pluralism, gender equity, legal status, and social equality for the LBGQ community, which we did not discuss, mm. dignity for refugees, asylum seekers, and foreign workers, a commitment to help fight racism in Israel, environmental sustainability, and regional cooperation. And we want to fight anti-Semitism on both the left and the right. You want to learn more about us? Go to HatikvaSlate.net. There's even a bio on all of the amazing activists and progressive Jews that are work there, and we have ideas on what we've done in previous Zionist Congress elections and at the American Zionist movement. Remember, we have a role to play there as well. Go vote. Vote Hatikva Slate number eight. Go. This is your only democratic opportunity to influence what's going on in Israel, to change what it means to be Jewish. We are the only slate that actually put women in places of power in the national institutions. We love Israel. It's at the core of who we are, and it's time to now be a free people in our land and to build the next, the next state of the future of the Jewish people. You guys are, you guys are, you guys are fat. Was this the fastest two hours you've ever had in your life? It's unbelievable. I thank the two of you, but Ellie and Nomi and um, Josh and Liz and Yonatan, I cannot thank you enough. That concludes JBS's first of three World Zionist Congress election forums.
Our thanks again to Elliot Body, Naomi Colton Max, Josh Weinberg, Liz Burney, Jonathan Hersfeld for representing their slate so eloquently. And we wish each of them and their slates every success. And of course, my special thanks to you, our JBS audience, for sharing this election forum with us. And we'll be back you. We'll be back with you again tomorrow night for the second of our three election forums with representatives of four more slates: Dorshe Torah, Merkaz, Mizrahi, and Shas Olomi. And we hope that after watching all three election forums, you'll make a special point of voting online, ZionistElection.org. Until tomorrow night, for Shachar Azani, Tisha Bader, and the entire JBS crew, be well, my friends, and Am Yisrael Chai. You've been watching the first ever World Zionist Congress Election Forum, presented by JBS in partnership with AZN, the American Zionist Movement. We hope you've enjoyed and learned from the program. JBS, expanding Jewish understanding, celebrating all things Jewish. <laughs>